Hey, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a weekly security podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting August 21st, 2012. Due to some work travel, I'm going to have to post this video slightly later on Friday than normal, so I'm going to try to keep this episode very quick with only four news stories. However, there's a couple of other news stories I'd like to share, so I'll post information about those in the reference section of the WatchGuard Security Center blog post associated with this video. So if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com. The first story this week is about an iPhone SMS security vulnerability. Well, technically, this isn't really a vulnerability that's only affecting iPhones. It's kind of a spoofing vulnerability that could affect all SMS messages. Like email, SMS messages have various headers, such as the, the send from or reply to header. As it turns out, a security researcher has figured out ways to spoof the reply to header in an SMS message. Unfortunately, because Apple's SMS program actually pays attention to the reply to header, it means that an attacker can create a SMS message he sends to your iPhone, which appears to be coming from a person you actually trust. This might help attackers uh, do phishing attacks using iPhone SMS. Now again, this reply to spoofing issue could technically affect all SMS messages. However, other researchers have done tests on other mobile phones like Androids and Blackberries. In those phones, SMS applications don't pay attention to the reply to vulnerability, so they wouldn't really be affected by this sort of phishing attack. Later this week, Apple actually responded to this vulnerability and told their users that SMS really is not that safe and that they should be using iMessage instead, which is more secure. Now, unfortunately, iMessage only works among other iPhone users. It won't work if you're sending SMS text messages to other people. So hopefully in the future, uh, Apple will change their SMS app so that it won't be vulnerable to these sorts of phishing attacks. A second story from this week concerns some Adobe application vulnerabilities which cropped up. As you probably know, last week was Patch Tuesday, and among Microsoft's patches, Adobe also released many patches for Reader, Flash Player, and Shockwave. It turns out a lot of the Adobe Reader vulnerabilities which Adobe patched last week were found by two Google researchers. In fact, these researchers found 60 different crash vulnerabilities, 40 of which were exploitable. Now the problem is last week's Reader patch only fixed about 24 of these vulnerabilities and Google's researchers have stated that Reader is still vulnerable to 16 of these vulnerabilities. So there are some zero-day flaws still in Reader. Now, Google did uh, obfuscate some of their research, so they haven't really publicly disclosed these 16 vulnerabilities, but you better keep your eye out for yet another Adobe Reader patch in the next few weeks or months to come. In related Adobe news, Adobe also released a Flash Player uh, update last week. Unfortunately, they weren't quite finished patching Flash, so this week they released yet another Flash Player update which fixes six more flaws. So if you use Flash Player, even if you use it on Linux or, or Android devices, be sure to go and get uh, Adobe's Flash update from this week. An Apple-focused security company named Intego released more details about some new Mac malware this week. I won't actually go into the details about the malware because it's actually pretty lame, uninteresting malware, and it has quite a few bugs in it. However, the reason I'm bringing up this new Mac malware is it does have one interesting aspect. Currently, Black Hat attackers are attempting to sell this Mac malware toolkit on the criminal underground for around $60. And one of the things that show us that a particular platform is being more targeted, such as the Mac platform, is when attackers start sharing and trading and selling their malware toolkits or their attack toolkits to one another uh, to use in criminal attacks. So seeing a Mac malware toolkit being traded and sold on the underground is just another sign that attackers are starting to go after Macintosh computers more aggressively. So if you do use Apple products, it's a good idea to start considering security software and security devices to help protect those products. I'll end this week with what I think is the biggest story of the week, and it's an update about the crisis malware I talked about a few weeks ago. 
uh, back during the Black Hat DEF CON uh, conferences, I brought up this cross-platform malware called Crisis. Crisis arrived as a jar file, which is a Java archive file, and it exploited a cross-platform vulnerability in Java to infect both Mac and Windows PC computers. This week, new research surfaced from Symantec and Kaspersky detailing some other functionality of the Crisis malware. Most importantly, Crisis does a very, very new thing which I've never seen malware do before. When Crisis infects Windows computers, among other things, it searches your computer for VMware formatted virtual images. If it can find any virtual image files on your computer, it then uses a VMware player tool to mount that image and infect that image with a copy of its malware. This means any virtual images sitting on your computer will become infected as well. Now, this is a very new way for malware to spread. I've never seen malware specifically target target virtual images before. And I believe this is very dangerous because unlike you know, physical computers, we often clone and copy and share virtual images. If you're an average IT administrator, chances are you probably have some base virtual images you always use whenever you're building a new virtual server or virtual PC. So if one of those base images gets infected, you could inadvertently spread that, that infection all over your virtual environment. To me, this really highlights the need for us to have more security controls and more visibility into our virtual networks. Uh, a lot of times, people that uh, manage virtual environments don't use uh, host-based virtual security solutions, or more importantly, network-based virtual uh, security solutions. The vSwitch, or virtual network in these environments, is usually a black hole as far as security visibility is concerned. Uh, one solution, by the way, is using our physical appliances, which we've now released as virtual images. We now have both XTM and XESV, which are virtual versions of our very powerful security appliances. While they won't actually prevent this sort of malware from infecting virtual machines on your physical hosts, they will help detect when this malware is doing connections on your actual virtual networks. So I highly recommend you start considering security solutions for your virtual networks. Well, that covers yet another week of information security. Hopefully you got your fill of malware, network attack, and security update news and found some of this information useful or educational. As always, if you want more regular updates about network and information security news, be sure to follow our blog, watchguardsecuritycenter.com, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.